Hi, I'm Katie Derbyshire. I'm reading from Daheim Home by Judith Herrmann, published by Fisher Verlag. Back then, that summer almost 30 years ago, I lived in West Germany, far away from the water. I had a studio flat on a high-rise estate in a medium-sized town and a job at the cigarette factory. The work was easy. I had to make sure the rod of tobacco ran into the cutter perfectly straight. That was all. The machine did it, actually. It had a sensor that the tobacco jugged past, and if it wasn't straight, the machine would stop. It stopped like someone running into a wall. It stopped with a horrific jolt. The sensor often didn't work, so I stood next to the machine and watched the rod, adjusting it if it shifted out of place. From 7 to 12, half an hour's lunch break, and then another three hours. I looked away fairly often. I looked over at the cutter in which the rod was sliced into single cigarettes, from which thousands of cigarettes fell, all the cigarettes the people out in the city would smoke, for work, during breaks, after meals, while arguing, while making love and after making love. Smoke. The job at the cigarette factory was all right. I kept out of things, or rather, I didn't get worked up about things. I wore earplugs while the other women didn't. They actually insisted on talking to each other in the midst of the hellish noise on the factory floor. I couldn't understand them because of my earplugs, but I could watch them yelling at each other. Their faces were reddened and shiny. The tendons on their necks stood out, strong and beautiful. They gesticulated. They had precise, curt gestures for fucking and failing, for anger the end of something for triumph. They laughed a lot and pointed at each other, slapped their thighs with laughter and wiped away tears with the backs of their hands. Most of them were quite pretty despite the shapeless overalls, the fuzzy gauze hairnets, despite the heat on the factory floor that made exhausted creatures out of all of us. At lunch break you had to say the word Mildzeit. You had to wish everyone a good lunch. Mildzeit in the lift, the corridors, the canteen, in the queue for food. I didn't feel like saying my side, and at some point they noticed and they ordered me into the shift manager's office. The shift manager was sitting behind his desk. He rolled back and forth on his chair and looked me up and down and what he saw didn't interest him very much. He nodded as if he'd known something all, anyway all along and gave a bored yawn. As he yawned, he said, so we all say my side at lunchtime here. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, you know very well what I'm talking about. Of course I knew. I wasn't intending to stay at the factory to spend my life there, and I just couldn't stand the word mildside. He said, listen, love, it's very simple. If you're not capable of saying mildside, you're out on your ear. It wasn't about the word. It was about the rules and about power. I thought for a moment about that sudden love, about the temperature in his office, the room in which he killed time. We stared at each other. Then he let me go. In the evenings I'd often sit in my balcony on the fifth floor. One of the previous tenants had left their flower boxes behind and there were plants growing in the boxes that I'd never seen before. Delicate green stems with white flowers the size of match tips. I never watered them but they were still there. There was an artificial lawn on the floor, a folding table and a single chair and the view was of the dual carriageway in the petrol station. I liked that view a lot. The illuminated blue of the petrol station, the cars pulling in, pulling out, the displays of sad plastic wrapped bouquets, the sacks of barbecue charcoal outside the door, the way people got out of their cars and filled them up, daydreaming as they watched the digital numbers on their petrol pumps rattle round, the way they went inside and flicked through the newspapers, bought beer, chocolate and mints. I imagined all these people were going on a long journey, filling their petrol tanks on a really long drive, people passing through. Ask them for directions and they shrug and say, oh, I'm not from round here, I don't know why you're around, sorry. I'd sit on the balcony on the only chair, my feet on the table, smoking cigarettes from the factory, and I'd tap the edge, ash over the edge and drop the butt in a can coke. I smoked a lot back then. It was very hot that summer and I'd sit outside in my underwear until it got late and dark at last. The lights went on in the flats one by one. The headlamps of the cars on the dual carriageway flared up. 
The sun was gone, the heat remained. The heat wouldn't abate, it hung between the buildings, static. I got into the habit of going down to the petrol station for an ice cream. I put on a sundress and flip-flops, take my keys and some change and walk down, never taking the lift. I'd walk down the stuffy, dirty stairs and I'd never turn the light on in the stairwell. It was even hotter outside, the asphalt soft from the heat. And all the windows were open, you could hear the TVs, the arguments, the slamming of doors. The cars inched up to the petrol pumps in slow motion, the drivers filling them up like sleepwalkers. The entrance opened automatically and it was bright and cool inside. The radio was always on. I'd slide the ice cream freezer open and stand in front of the open chest as long as possible and then I'd take a Moscow ice cream. Only ever a Moscow ice cream, never any other kind. But still I'd pretend every time that I could make my mind up. The woman behind the counter was the same age as I am now. Amazingly enough, she'd be reading a book and she'd put it aside when she had to serve people in an extremely reluctant way. That impressed me. It was the same woman night after night and we didn't exchange one word of conversation all summer.